Good morning, Astronomy 1020. Welcome to part two of lecture, what are we, 13 now? <clears throat> yeah, I think we're, we're, what did I put in the announcement? We're lecture 13. And today we're gonna be doing, oh, you annoying son of a bitch. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's this blackboard, it drives me crazy. Sorry, whoops, didn't mean to say that on record. Uh, anyways, uh, welcome to our 13th lecture part two. And today we're actually gonna get into stellar remnants and the death of stars. So we're going to be covering that that last little column uh, in the in the sort of big table that we made in the last class explaining the fusion life cycles of stars, and that means we've got some cool stuff to talk about today, and it'll probably bleed over into Tuesday's class, where we'll be having a lab on period uh, Cepheid variable stars, pulsating stars, and how they're used in astronomy, and then uh, on our final day. If we're running behind, we can lovingly talk about black holes and general relativity. I'll show you guys some pictures of galaxies. And I think the plan is to do one final homework, um, which might be just random questions from the different chapters, kind of a victory tour of all the different things that I think are kind of interesting, cute problems. Today's homework on the death of stars is actually pretty quick and efficient. So it shouldn't be too bad uh, compared to some of the other ones we've done. Uh, <clears throat> course announcements. Uh, because I should remember to remind you guys that next week is our final week of lecture. And I'd like to say it again on the recording that uh, anyone who wishes to take the final exam and try their luck <clears throat> is welcome to do so. But if you are comfortable using your midterm grade in place of your final, you can uh, escape hatch your way out of the exam death maze. <clears throat> so people only need to send me a message if they are planning on taking the exam, because most people probably will just choose to not take it if they can get out of it. And that's OK. Um, so next week will be the last week. That means I got to have all your work in kind of in a timely fashion, right? I kind of got a little more loose with my turn in dates, uh, partially because I was a little behind on grading, and that seemed fair. But I think like next week, you'll have a lab and a homework to turn in, and I kind of need you to turn that in by Sunday. Maybe I'll give you till Monday or Tuesday, but I need to close the books on this course. So the, so everyone just keep that in mind. You guys usually turn it in right away because you're here live with me, but I am concerned for those people who take a few days sometimes to do it. Okay, let's talk science. Um, <clears throat> here are the things that we're planning on talking about today. Um, so chapter 18 in the book is on what we sometimes call in astronomy Stellar remnants. Stellar remnants are the dead husks of stars, okay? So they are the dead husks of stars. And you guys remember our definition of star that we use in this class, right? What's the definition of star? What's the difference between a star and a protostar or a big ball of gas? Um, star is a ball of gas with fusion. That's right. My joke for what a star is, a star is a ball with fusion. Okay. That's, that's sort of a joke, but it gets the point across. A star is a ball with fusion. <clears throat> it turns out that the husks, the stellar remnants left behind, do not undergo fusion. That's why the stars die. And so technically, these things are not actually stars in the sense that they do not have self-sustaining nuclear fusion associated with them. Yet we call them stars. Some of them glow and emit light. Some of them don't. Um, but they're weird, and they're cool, and they're fun to think about. And they include white dwarfs. They include neutron stars, they include <clears throat> black holes. There are a few variations on these things, but we'll start off with these three categories. And if we're going to talk about remnants, these are what are left over from the, from the stellar core. So you'll remember all of these objects come from what's left over in the inner core of the star, where the fusion had been taking place. 
there's also a remnant associated with the outer envelopes of stars. The outer envelope is what in our own sun would be considered the radiation zone, the convection zone, and the photosphere, just the, the hydrogen and helium that's not undergoing fusion. And uh, so they include planetary nebulae, AE if it's plural, right? That's how it works in Latin. Planetary nebulae and supernova remnants. I've shown you some pictures of these things, but maybe we'll take a quick peek at them again. There's a lot more to talk about with these guys than there is. These are just kind of pretty pictures. Although there, there is some science associated with this as we start talking about a galaxy and we start thinking about how stellar life cycles affect a galaxy, then we get into this a little bit more. <clears throat> I'm hoping to touch on a little bit of that in our final class next week. Okay, I suppose we should start there, but just to make sure that you're well-trained and that you understand where we came from, can you guys tell me which type of stars are producing white dwarfs versus neutron stars versus black holes? I just wanna make sure that you remember that before we go forward. Um, white, white. Huh? Go ahead, Vladimir, just anyone. Uh, I believe white dwarfs uh, come from small stars like our sun. Be careful when you use the word small because I'm going to start thinking radius. And you uh, might low be mass, right there. Okay. But low mass. Low mass. We have to be a little persnickety here, okay? So, so these guys come from low mass stars. And in fact, what we mean by low mass is low to intermediate mass. Because remember, intermediate mass stars don't really get past this stage. Uh, so that's anywhere from 0.1 all the way up to eight solar masses. Let's put low dash intermediate, INT. Oh, that's right, because they die like losers. They die like the little losers, yep. <clears throat> okay, and now here, of course, are the high mass stars. Actually, this kind of <clears throat> reminds me, and this might be a good time to mention it, there was a small gap in our learning, something that a little puzzle piece that I forgot to include. And I actually forgot to include this maybe three weeks ago. <laughs> Remember when we tried to study stellar formation, the formation of stars and the interstellar medium? I felt so bad about that lecture because there were so many parts of it that I, I, I didn't get to cover. In the interest of making the class run smooth, I skipped some things. But there's one little tiny thing that I forgot <clears throat> to include that I think is really important. And that's about, if you look out into the galaxy in nature, what types of stars does uh, nature prefer to make? And I'll tell you the advanced name for this thing, but let's just look at a fun galaxy for a second. Let's look at, um, oh, I don't know, the Whirlpool Galaxy. I don't think I've shown you a picture of the Whirlpool Galaxy yet, but the Whirlpool Galaxy is what we call a grand design spiral galaxy. And in a grand design spiral galaxy, you see two very prominent arms to your galaxy that kind of wind out. This one's also interesting because it's an example of what we would call a galaxy collision. This spiral here is actually gravitationally devouring another galaxy that's slightly smaller and ripping stars and gas out of it, kind of like a starfish eating a sea anemone or something. If you've ever seen that in the nature show. Um, <clears throat> during galaxy collisions, remember from our early classes, the galaxies collide, but the stars don't. So the gas kind of gets pulled into the galaxy that triggers some star formation. The stars are kind of just get added to this larger spiral, but a very beautiful spiral galaxy. <clears throat> we can count stars in our own galaxy and we can sort of observe the colors of other galaxies to get a sense of how many stars nature creates of the low mass variety, of the intermediate mass variety and of the high mass variety. And astronomers refer to this as the initial mass function. How many stars does nature like to make? Um, 
Do you guys want to take a guess? Does nature make equal numbers of low, intermediate, and high mass stars? Does she like to make intermediate more, low more, high more? What do you think? Um, I believe that the most abundant stars are low mass stars. That is correct. So either you did some reading on your own, or maybe I did mention this briefly. Either way, it's cool because you learned it. Um, the picture that I wanted to show, and this is just in case I haven't, uh, they tried to sum up what's a very confusing thing, the initial mass function, with a very simple and quite elegant diagram. The idea was for every one O or B type star, one of those big, bright blue stars that become super giants. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze here. <laughs> Must be all that. Uh, cosmic nano dust in my apartment. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> uh, for every one big high mass star, like an O and B type star, nature might create something like 10 spectral type A stars, like the bright white star Sirius. Uh, relative to the 10 A stars, nature might produce 50 G type stars, like our own sun. And then the very lowest mass stars, the K and Ms, nature will produce 200 of them. So you can see that nature really prefers to make, as uh, Vladimir said, the low mass stars and even intermediate mass stars rather than O and B type stars. Now, which of these, take, take a guess here to make see if you remember, which of these do you think can form neutron stars and black holes? O and B type stars? Pretty much just that one, right, Vladimir? Yeah. So you see my point. We would expect it out there in nature, there'd be a lot more white dwarfs and planetary nebulae. And relative to that, the number of neutron stars and black holes would be low. On the other hand, we do have a big sample size to draw from, right? We are remembering that <clears throat> galaxies contain hundreds of billions of stars. And you can see that there are plenty of big, bright O and B type stars floating around a galaxy. Although if you look at most spiral galaxies, I'm just throwing this out there for kicks. This picture is a little goofy because they've done some things to the filters to highlight what are called H2 regions. Maybe I'll tell you about that sometime. Um, but typically, um, NGC, sorry, New General Catalog 1300. This is a barred spiral galaxy that I've shown you before, but this one's nice because it's true color. This is this is very much what the color of a spiral galaxy would look like to your eye had you observed it through your own backyard telescope. You guys will notice that the colors of the spiral arms are predominantly blue. You remember that that means the light is being dominated by the spectral O and B types. Whereas the, the so-called bulge of the galaxy somewhere in the center, you're seeing very much reddish colored light. And this means, uh, by the way, all of the gas and dust is found here, okay? And even here in the gaps, there's lots of gas and dust there. But the bulges are actually pretty devoid of gas. The gas has all been used up and it's basically just a big swirl of stars. Like, like if you've ever seen a swarm of bees, the stars are all kind of rotating around each other. Um, <clears throat> that means the spectral types dominating the light are the K and M's here. The spectral types dominating the light here are O and Bs. So these short-lived high mass stars, we tend to find them in the arms and disks of spiral galaxies. We do not find them in the bulge, nor do we find them in the halo. I was explaining to someone the other day what a halo is, sombrero galaxy. Let's look at another legendary galaxy. This one is seen edge on, so it affords us a slightly different view of a of a spiral galaxy. Um, the, the galaxies I just showed you a moment ago are called face-on galaxies because you're looking from above down at their face. Um, the sombrero, whoa, this is epic. Okay, this is a big damn picture. All right, I don't know. Um, wow, that's having trouble loading. This is an edge-on galaxy. So you can see the so-called dust lanes. You really get a sense of how much gas is in there. 
But this affords me the opportunity to quickly tell you the parts of a galaxy in case I want to refer to them later. Because as we start thinking of bigger picture stuff, I'm going to want to use these terms. So there's the disk. Okay. You guys have probably heard me use these terms without defining them for. There's your disk. Okay. Um, there's the bulge. Sorry, I'm trying this out. Okay. And the bulge is here. But do you guys see all of this fuzzy light up here that kind of circles around the galaxy? That's another component to the galaxy. Now, you know, I'd really like it if this picture would fully load for me. I'm going to regret this. I know it. Yep. Okay, hold on. Maybe a slightly less good picture of the Sombrero Galaxy is called for here. Normally, I like the highest resolution possible, but this is probably very tedious. Um, in fact, what I should have done is I should have. Oh, yeah, that's that's. Oh, 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 here we go. Never mind. All right. Um, <clears throat> I might have said this during that one class where you guys watched the pre-recorded video, but in case I didn't say it, <clears throat> in case past me did not tell you, I hope you guys realize that when you look at a picture of a galaxy, if you see an individual star, that star is definitely not a part of that galaxy. Have I explained why? Uh, I don't remember that. Okay. The answer is that galaxies are like wicked, wicked far away, right? Like they're millions of light years away or more, sometimes hundreds of millions of light years away. At those distances, you can no longer resolve individual stars as point sources. Instead of actually seeing a point source, the light from the individual stars gets smeared out into a distributed fuzz of light. So do you guys see all this, this glowy fuzz? That glowy fuzz is the light from billions and billions of stars, all which are unresolved. So then, of course, if I were to ask you guys, what about the stars that we can see in this picture? Now, I can tell what the stars are here because I can see, do you see these diffraction spikes? Do you see those? You guys probably think it looks like star twinkle or something like that, right? See the star twinkle? Sorry, that's just diffraction, okay? And that's because a lot of telescopes have spider veins and um, the spider veins hold the secondary mirror. Here's an example of uh, when you look into a telescope. See these, uh, these spider veins here holding the secondary mirror? When the starlight passes around them, the diffraction of the light bending around the spider veins causes it. It kind of makes it look like a, a cool star twinkle effect, so it's not unpleasant. But I can usually tell where the stars are because I can see the spider veins, the diffraction. So this is a star. That's a star. That's probably a star. Uh, these might be stars because I can kind of see diffraction spikes there. But you'll see that the number of stars in this, what are all the rest of those little blips? They're all way more distant galaxies. Can you guys see that down there? That's a pair of colliding spiral galaxies. Can you see little spiral arms? Those are actually spiral galaxies that are way, 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 way deep into the cosmos. What about the stars that I can see, though? Where are those stars? I kind of hinted at it a second ago. Where are these stars, then, if they're not in that galaxy? Here's a hint. They're not in interval. They're in some, they're in some other galaxy. Yeah, what galaxy are they in, Vladimir? Uh, I don't know, probably in our galaxy or something. That's it. They are in our galaxy. See, because remember that we're little bug ants. Okay, so let's clear everything out. Oh, sorry. We're a little bug ant. Let me use a different color here. And our bug ant is located about here. When we look out into other galaxies, if we look along this line of sight or if we look along that line of sight, we have to look past a forest of stars within our own galaxy. So these are actually foreground stars that we're looking through, like, like seeing a meadow beyond a forest grove. The, the, those are the trees that are in, those are the uh, stars that are in the foreground, okay? So anytime you see a star in a picture of galaxies, anytime you see a star in the sky, you know that star is in the Milky Way because the, by the time you leave the Milky Way, you can't even see individual stars anymore. 
In other words, there is a third component to this galaxy. Now that we understand all that, there's the disk, there's the, the bulge, which is like the nucleus, but there's a third component of stars called the halo. You see that? The halo is a giant sphere of stars that rotates around the galaxy. And the stars actually plunge through the disk on Keplerian ellipses. The stars plunge through the disk and they orbit the galaxy just like a, almost like a planet orbiting the sun perpendicular to the ecliptic or something. All right. So I wasn't intending on going off on galaxies for a second, but it might be important to talk about this because what type of stars do you think dominate the light from the halo? It's a little hard to see here because it kind of looks white. If you had to take a guess, O and Bs, K and Ms, what do you think? Mateus? O and B, I think. Unfortunately, that's not correct. The halo does not contain a lot of gas. Remember, Mateus, that relative to K and M type stars, uh, there was no way you should have known the answer, Mateus, because it just looks like a white fuzz to you, okay? So it's not like it was extremely clear. Other studies and other pictures of the halo do make it clear. But um, <clears throat> the important thing to remember, Mateus, is if you look at the main sequence lifetime of stars by mass, O and B types only live for about 10 million years, right? So the, the halo doesn't contain any gas or dust. If there were O and Bs, they would quickly just burn right out and they would end up leaving the much longer lived K and M type stars. Now, if there was gas in the halo, they might be able to reform some fresh O and B type stars. But for the most part, these stars are the ones you find in the bulge in the halo you find all of the stars in the disk because nature is creating all varieties, but you end up seeing the O and Bs in the disk because wherever the O and Bs are, they dominate the light. We've talked about that before. Okay. Anyways, um, that was a little riff on where we've been and, and thinking about the big picture for a second. Let's talk about white dwarfs. Let's talk about these low mass K and M type stars. After they die, what happens? Oh, I still need the high mass for the... Sorry, Andy. I'm so sorry. Um, Eight uh, solar masses to 100 solar wait, masses. We didn't talk about black holes. We we're we're building up to black. Oh, okay. you, don't just, you don't just get to talk about black holes. You have to earn black holes. So it's okay, eight, we're eight getting through 100. Yes. Uh, eight to 100. And over here it said uh, supernova remnant. Okay. So it said neutron star, black hole. Oh, I got the supernova. Okay, and that the the high mass stars were eight to a hundred solar masses. I'm very sorry, Andy. I always try to ask. Sorry. All right. So let's do the white dwarf thing. All right. Um, <clears throat> white dwarfs. Do you guys remember what element is the last element created within the core of a high mass star? What's the final element that's left behind? Iron. Sorry, Vladimir? High mass star, iron? No, no. Uh, we're talking white dwarfs, which are from low mass stars, right? Oh, uh, carbon. Carbon. So what we have is basically a ball of degenerate carbon. Do you guys remember what I mean by the word degenerate? Mm, entirely. Mm, inert. Oh, wait, no, degenerate state of matter. Okay, okay, okay. Degenerate is a state of matter almost, right? It's, ah, it's when the molecules are so dense. Uh, it, it, there are probably no molecules in here. It's probably so high. No, no molecules. I mean atoms. Atoms. When yeah. atoms are packed so densely together, that ele uh, that electrons start to like uh, yeah. run off of them. No? Yeah. So let's let's try to imagine this gas that you see bopping around the box is a normal gas. In a normal gas, the ideal gas law holds 
there is a relationship between pressure, density, and temperature. When a gas starts to become so packed that the interparticle separation becomes less than the diameters of the atoms, quantum mechanical effects take over where atoms start to get close to overlapping in energy states. Let's see if we can make this gas degenerate. The maker of this gift probably did not have degenerate gases in mind, but I'm just gonna see what I could do, okay? Now, once a gas becomes degenerate like this, okay, there is a, oh shit, I just blew the lid off that thing. Okay, <laughs> so whoop, get back in there, degenerate gases. Let's use a light species so they can't, can I keep the lid fixed? I don't know. Okay, so let's, there we go. Let's make this gas degenerate, okay? Um, when a gas starts turning into this, it still has a pressure associated with it, but the pressure is no longer related to temperature. Now, this gas has a temperature that the atoms are buzzing back and forth quite rapidly. But what's supporting the gas from further collapse is not the kinetic energies of the particles. It now becomes the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the way I've kind of lamely described the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to you in the past is I've said to you, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle means two electrons or two protons, they can't occupy the same quantum state. They cannot have the same energy, the same spin. But what it really means in a goofy particle sense is they can't kind of overlap. They can't have the same state variables. They you can think of it lamely as like they can't overlap one another, but that's a very lame particle way of thinking. The problem is electrons and protons ultimately are not dumb ass particles. They're elegant waves, which can overlap in the same position in space. However, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle gives them almost like a particle like nature in that it says, even if they can overlap with each other in space, they can't have the same energy, the same vibration, the same spin, the same angular momentum and other things like that. You guys will have encountered the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you ever took a chemistry class, you will remember that within an atom for each orbit or energy level, you can have two electrons, one electron spin up and one electron spin down. And if you remember your chemistry class, that's how you were supposed to arrange atoms with inside these orbits you were using the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can't have two electrons in the same orbit with the same spin and yada, yada, yada. It probably made no damn sense to you. And it probably still doesn't because honestly, quantum mechanics is freaking confusing, okay? But you're gonna have to take my word for it that degenerate gases have a, and this is an important part of the psyche of white dwarf stars. So let's take some notes and then I'll try to show you some pictures. So this is uh, the core of a former low or intermediate mass star. Um, it's usually made of very hot carbon, but there are other types of white dwarfs. So I'm gonna mention this now, sometimes they're made of oxygen, carbon, oxygen. Uh, oh, there's another element too. Maybe, I don't know if it's nitrogen, but sometimes they have carbon, oxygen, white dwarfs. Usually carbon is what you want to remember, but sometimes oxygen can be in there too. Um, they are held not by fusion. So they are in hydrostatic equilibrium. In other words, they won't be squished into a black hole by gravity. Um, due to not gravity versus thermal pressure, but what we would call electron degeneracy pressure. And that's what I was talking about, about those electrons not being able to overlap. Um, Typical masses, remember how we talked about the core of our own star being actually roughly half the mass of the star? 
because the density gets higher and higher as you get inside of it. A typical range of masses for a white dwarf is maybe half uh, a solar mass all the way up to about 1.4 solar masses. It's going to turn out that this is an extreme limit to the mass of a white dwarf. But I suppose this isn't even fair, right? Because if stars can be as low mass as a tenth of a solar mass, probably in reality, they can go from 0.05 solar masses all the way up to 1.4 solar masses. That's, that's a rough guess. I'm not sure if we know what the lower limit is. However, this, so basically, usually when I think of what's the mass of a typical white dwarf, approximately one solar mass is a really good reference point because a lot of them are, are kind of close to that. Um, <clears throat> however, they are highly compact. And their radii are typically approximately the same as the radius of the Earth, which is close to 6,000 kilometers. And you'll notice that I put an exclamation point next to that. Nature does not usually like to pack an entire star's worth of mass into a sphere the size of little old Earth. That would be awkward, right? Try to imagine for a second packing that much matter into the size of Earth. Um, let's see. They yeah, have... like okay, Vladimir and friends. Let's see if we can guess something about their luminosity profile. Um, Andy, let me know when you get this last bit here. I might want to. I just... got it. Oh, you got it. Okay. So allow me to just take this out for a second because I need a little bit more board space. Um, they have high temperatures, maybe of the order of 20,000 to 30,000 Kelvin. Remember, these things were once the cores of stars at millions of Kelvin temperatures. So once the surfaces are exposed to space, they probably cool down a bit, but they're still ridiculously hot. But they have a small radius. So tell me, guys, based on what you know about stars, what's their luminosity going to be like? Mm. Okay. Mm. Will they be luminous, or will be will they be dim? I'd say that they will be pretty dim. Why? Because uh, so. T to the fourth. So luminosity is controlled by T to the fourth and R to the uh, R to the second. I mean R squared. Jesus. Right. So T so is nice. pretty high, but uh, but radius is just so freaking small that it... this is something very subtle, and Vladimir has threaded the needle so perfectly. At first, naively, you would think they would be very luminous because you'd say, okay, my temperature is way bigger than my radius. And if temperature is raised to the fourth power, that should dominate the luminosity term. But what's really going on here is these temperatures are similar to an O-type star. They're only a factor of three greater than our dimmest stars. But this radius, oh, sorry, that's not Kelvin, that's kilometers, right? This radius is so stupid small compared to the radius of a typical star that their, their surface areas are so pitiful that they just can't shine enough light, no matter how bright you make them. And for this reason, the luminosities are, I'm going to use a, an inappropriate word, dim should be used for brightness, but I want to give you the flavor of the feeling. So the luminosities, I'm going to say very dim. And that means they're hard to spot because they don't stand out against the other stars.
So let's see, guys. High temperature. Uh, let's imagine this was a test question. These are the kind of test questions I'm going to ask. An object has high temperature, small radius, and low luminosity. Where will it be found on an HR diagram? Where is high temperature, low luminosity, small radius found? Uh, left uh, bottom That's corner. Right. They'll all be found here because temperature increases to the left. Luminosity increases like this and radius drops like so, okay? In fact, let's look at those actual HR diagrams taken of probably some famous star cluster. Let's leave those, ooh, those gases seem to have undegenerated themselves. Get back in there, degenerate gases. Okay, there we go. All you right. should probably squeeze the box too. Oh yeah, true. <laughs> Boof, the problem is that the pressure builds up too much. Okay. Flies off automatically. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Vladimir. You know what we gotta do? We gotta, we gotta pump the gas, squeeze the box and add gravity. That's how we can do it. So here's your gravity, boof, all the way up. Let's make lots of gravity. Let's really jam some in there. And now let's squeeze the box. Ah. There's the carbon of your white door. Ah, damn it, okay. All right, well, we'll let that chill for a minute. Packing this much matter into, one, into this small place, it's like sitting in a toilet with on a toilet with transparent walls. Like other <laughs> I'm going to have to meditate on that analogy, Vladimir. I don't, I don't know if I like it. <laughs> I don't know if I like it. <laughs> Anyways, let's just look at a real HR diagram. I have two on display here. Notice that, ooh. now white dwarfs are found down here. So of these 6,000 stars, it looks like I grabbed maybe one white dwarf or something. Huh. Now this doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Because there's lots and lots of low mass stars and they die all the time. Shouldn't there be more than just one white dwarf? What do you guys think? Why am I only detecting one white dwarf? Let's put our best noodle on this. Mm. My best take would be that first is they're hard to spot and second they die less often than the well, high mass how would, a, how would a white dwarf die like let's look at a cartoon picture uh, by the way let's just look for white dwarfs in our next uh hr no, not white dwarf die i mean like uh low mass and <clears throat> intermediate mass stars die uh it takes them longer to die you know hold on do you see how we found four white dwarfs here out of maybe tens of thousands of stars yeah I want to talk about that. Let's think about what's going to happen to a white dwarf. When a star dies, our term death is like a cartoon term. What we mean is it runs out of nuclear fusion. But white dwarfs really don't have nuclear fusion going, right? They have gravity versus electron degeneracy pressure, gravity versus quantum mechanics. Let's try to just look at a picture of what we would imagine such a thing to look like. Um, so here's... Here's the sun as a red giant, okay? And F function F5, seven. Rem remember that when the sun becomes a double shell fusing giant, when it's fusing hydrogen into helium and helium is fusing into carbon, it's packing all that carbon right down in there. The outer envelopes of the stars expand off into the planetary nebula. And here's that little tiny white dwarf left behind. And um, the white dwarf is made of carbon. What do we know about carbon? Let's go through the, I wanna skip these planetary nebulae because I've shown them to you before. So let's imagine this white dwarf star, whatever the hell it is, sitting there in space. It's got a radius of 6,000 kilometers. It's in hydrostatic equilibrium, but it's not fusing. It is shining light. What will happen to the star over time as it continues to shine its energy into space? Remember, it's not making new energy due to fusion in there. Uh, it's like a black body is going to shine, shine itself out. It's going to shine itself out, just like a, a hot potato on your windowsill. It'll keep giving off radiation at the expense of energy of the star, and eventually 
it's going to go dark. It'll become an invisible husk, a cinder, a, a coal, a, a coal, a dead cinder. Actually, coal is mostly made out of carbon, so it's not a terrible analogy, right? Um, and so what's happening here, guys, when we look at an HR diagram and we hunt for white dwarfs, this is what an astronomer would call a selection effect. It's statistical. You not only have to be able to spot a nearby white dwarf, but it has to have recently become a white dwarf so that it's still shining enough light for you to see it all. The other white dwarfs, the ones that we're not seeing, are plunging down in, in, in temperature and in luminosity until they go dark, so to speak. But they must be out there. How long is it visible for? Um, there is a, you can actually calculate the time scale, right? Uh, it's been a while since I've had, to, I had to do a calculation like this maybe when I was a senior or something. But what you do is you imagine a star, uh, you imagine a ball 6,000 kilometers across, you give it a temperature. And then what you do is you, in fact, whoa, I bet with even our skills, we might be able to work this out. I, I'm not hundred percent sure, but. So like you said that if a star was a black, if our sun was a black body, it would shine, it would shine itself out in like hundred million years. Right. So that's the gravitational time scale. It would probably be some, actually, we don't need to do the calculation, Vladimir, because that's probably what the answer would be. It would probably be a hundred million years or less, which sounds like a long time compared to you and your pet poodle there, but it's not a very long time for the galaxy, but I, under a hundred million years. So yeah, what, what you would do is you would, you would start off with the luminosity is 10 to the minus three solar luminosities. You translate that into watts which is some number of joules per second. Then you try to estimate how many joules did I store inside that sphere, probably during the gravitational release. You'd flip this upside down, multiply it by the joules, you'd get some number of seconds. And it probably would end up being 10 million to 100 million years. That's probably what you would get. Um, <clears throat> I have done that calculation before. I don't know if it's worth it for me to fumble around because I'd have to navigate the maze a little bit. Um, so great question. Awesome question. Let's think about some other things. Okay. There's more to think about. They are often found in binary pairs. And this is going to turn out to be a key issue. Do you guys remember the percentage of stars? 50. Every three out of two stars are binary. That's the joke. Three out of every two stars is a binary, right? Yeah, so, I told this joke already to everybody in my family. Oh, that's great. I bet they love you now for that, Vladimir. <laughs> I bet you. <laughs> but the funny thing about astronomy jokes is usually they're not funny to anyone except for astronomers. Right? So, but we take a secret pride in them nonetheless, OK? Um, <clears throat> but before I talk about the binary issue, I want to talk about carbon, and I want to talk about their densities. They're very dense, and it's very dense carbon. Do you guys remember, I did do this once, the Wikipedia page called the allotropes of carbon. Do you remember what an allotrope is? Um, diamond. Oh, wait. Oh, what an allotrope is. Oh, okay. Well, you, diamond is one of the allotropes. It's... Uh, a molecule that is made only over one element. Yeah, kind of. Oh, it's not a molecule. Yeah, actually, well, it, it's a, it's like a crystal structure, right? Crystal structure. Yeah. Um, it's it's, but you, you might be able to call it a molecule. Yes. Um, it's ways you can arrange pure carbon, in a geometrical. The, the physicists would call it a lattice. They'd call it a lattice work, and in carbon. The two do allotropes come only from uh, carbon? Huh? Do allotropes come only from carbon? No, like... you can have allotropes of all kinds of different things, including molecules, I believe. But in nature, there are other allotropes of carbon, but, but graphite and diamond are two of the big ones. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who might have missed that lecture, there's just a lovely little uh, picture that just sums the whole thing up. Boy, I'm going a little slow today, but I've got some time to work with. So uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. let's do um, allotropes of carbon. 
Carbon is actually one of the most abundant atoms in the universe after hydrogen and helium. Remember that carbon and oxygen were like tied for number three in terms of their popularity. And uh, the picture that I love to show students is here. This basically perfectly sums up what an allotrope is, no explanation needed. What you can see is graphite on the right, diamond on the left. They're both made of arrangements of carbon atoms. The graphite is structured in sheets and the sheets are made of six carbons arranged in a, a hexagram, these hexagram-like carbons that are all locked together. Here, the carbons have been altered in their position into what we call a tetrahedronal state. You guys know what a tetrahedron is, right? Like a pyramid? So the, the atoms are kind of arranged in a tetrahedron, sort of in a tetrahedronal shape. And, and they're locked together in a more complex way. Notice that these two things, if you were to see them with your eye, you, you wouldn't necessarily know that they were both made of the same stuff. It's amazing how you change the optical properties of a material just by rearranging those atomic structure. Anyways, what do you think white dwarfs would be made out of? Would they be made out of diamond? Are they like a diamond in the sky or are they like a big pencil lead in the sky? I'd go with the diamond. Diamond? Why diamond? Because the pressure is so immense. Right. So, Vladimir, you are saying on Earth, diamonds are created when carbon gets compressed under the geological layers of Earth, correct? Considering, so that, considering that this carbon is under a very high pressure. And by the way, we have detected the spectral absorption lines of diamond in white dwarfs before. Unfortunately, the answer is sort of neither. And to understand why, we really need to calculate their density. Yeah, so I was just about to ask that because they're so dense that like the quantum world is starting to kick in. Like, Doesn't it just mess up the whole structure? It really does because those, those atoms still have a great interparticle spacing, but we're talking about degenerate matter, exactly. And as a demonstration of that point, Vladimir, let's calculate the density of the material. Density, of course, is mass over volume. Does anyone remember the volume of a sphere, the formula? Uh, four thirds by r cubed. So let's flip the let's flip the three back up onto the top because we don't like to have fractions in our denominator. So for a sphere, three m over four pi r cubed. This is the formula. I often use delta for density. That's kind of something I do. This could be considered, and we're going to need this for our homeworks today. This is the formula for the density of a sphere. Andy, let me know when you have that because I'm going to need some board space here. Um. <clears throat> I got it. Thank you. Let's do a little exercise where we calculate the density of a white dwarf. This will prep us uh, for our today's homework. It also is a good talking point. So what we use for mass units doesn't matter, right? Well, <clears throat> here's the real truth of it. Up to now, We've been using MKS units, which are kilograms per cubic meter. Those are units of density. But no astronomer or chemist or scientist usually works in kilograms per cubic meter. And there's a really easy reason to explain why. Imagine you wanted to measure experimentally densities in a lab, Vladimir. A cubic meter is about yay long and yay tall and yay deep. So you'd have to pick up quantities and samples of lead that would be a cubic meter, and that would be unpleasant to work in. On the other hand, typically the preferred units for density are grams per cubic centimeter. As an example of a common density, the density of water, which is what everything is kind of based off of, the density of water is designed to be one gram per cubic centimeter. 
Uh, by the way, it turns out that by a weird fluke of the, the very tenuous outer layers of stars and the inner layers of stars, the density of the sun, which of course is not made of water, don't get the wrong idea here, but the density of a star like our sun is wicked, wicked close to one gram per cubic centimeter. That's quinky dink, okay? So that's a typical density for a star. And that's because you're balancing the highly compressed interior against the really tenuous and ghost-like outer layers. Um, there's another thing that you guys don't know about, and I don't even know if I should bore you with it. Astronomers in particular do not work in MKS units. When I was an astronomy student, all of the variables that I had to memorize were all in grams, centimeters, um, uh, and seconds. They call it CGS unit system. So that works out well for astronomers. If you want to know why, someday I'll tell you. Okay, let's count out the density of a white dwarf in grams per cubic centimeter. So typically, a white dwarf has one solar mass, 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. That's how we've memorized it in this class. And typically, uh, a radius of Earth will go at 6,400 kilometers. Can you guys help me convert these into grams and centimeters as a sort of uh, victory lap on dimensional analysis? Dimensional analysis might actually turn out to be the most useful thing you learned in this class. It will help you in many other classes, and it probably can even help you in life. Tegan. I volunteer Tegan for the job. She's been telling me all day that she really wants to volunteer and participate. I'm going to give her that opportunity. <laughs> oh, yikes. Come on, Tegan. We'll give her um, All right. <laughs> all right. So we're going. Oh, God. <laughs> you need the division bar? Hmm? I put in the division bar for you. Okay. So times LX. Don't worry about the numbers. Just start off by worrying about the units. Okay, so we're going, um, wait, what? Uh, when we do dimensional analysis, Tegan, we try to cancel out units first. Yeah, yeah. I so, so I was we're imagining trying to... We're, trying to, we're trying to get to grams and centimeters, right? Okay, right so you're going to, you're going to want to cancel out kilograms, obviously. So we'll put that. Um, in there, right? So that's going to go in the bottom. And then we put. Um, it's going to be centimeters cubed or grams. It's going to be on top. Mass, right? Yeah, okay. that makes sense. Now we can worry about the, the conversion factor from grams to kilograms. How many grams would be in a kilogram? In a kilogram. B. Taken. A thousand? Yes. Very good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> a thousand grams per kilogram. So Tegan, Sorry. that's okay. There's, I know there's chaos, right? Um, if this has 30 zeros and I add three more zeros, how many zeros do I have? Um, you're gonna have 30. Wait. That's 10 to the power of three, right? Mm -hmm. That is a two followed by 30 zeros, and we're gonna multiply by a thousand. So we're going to add three more oh, zeros, to, right? Three more zero. Okay, so it's going to be 3,000? Wait. Not 3,000. 300. Three, no. Uh, Wait. Oh. Yeah. Look at okay. it this way. <laughs> Two times 10 to the 30 times 10 to the 3. Do you remember? Oh, 33. One? That's what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> 33 grams. All right. Sweet. Okay, uh, Mateus, why don't you help me go from kilometers to centimeters? All right, so we're going to do one kilometer in the bottom and one meet, I mean, 1,000 meters on top. Okay, that gets us to meters. And now we're going to do uh, 100 centimeters on top and one meter in the bottom. Okay, um, let's see if you can do scientific, uh, get it into scientific notation without a calculator. I'll All right, so one, two, six point four. Oh, okay, so 6.4 times 10 to the 8? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8. Nice. Centimeter. All right. Now we're ready to put this into our formula for the density of a sphere. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> King Hector died by... I thought it was King Henry's dog drinks chocolate milk. 
Um, when I was in fourth grade, I learned King Hector died by drinking chocolate milk. So that's, I was kind of like thinking cool. like in my brain while I was doing it. I'm trying to decide which one I like better. They're both kind of good. King Hector died by, see, I don't know who King Hector is, but I know who King Henry is. Maybe it's biblical. I don't know. So they have chocolate milk in biblical times. That doesn't make any sense. All right, let's go ahead and work this out. The density of a white dwarf then is three times two times 10 to the 33 grams over four times pi times 6.4 times 10 to the eight centimeters cubed. Okay, that's a you job. Punch it and crunch it while I sip some water. <clears throat> oh, wow. Um, so what you get? Three, uh, one point eight uh, million grams per cubic centimeter. I don't know if you want to do it to one significant figure. Yeah, because you get the point, Vladimir. Two million grams per cubic centimeter. Now, first of all, everyone write that down, and then let's think. <clears throat> Okay, let's take a think about the density of different atoms in the periodic table at standard temperatures and pressures. To do that, I've prepared a chemistry table for us. And I want you to notice that in the legend, they list the density in grams per cubic centimeter at a temperature of 300 Kelvin, okay? Seven grams per cubic centimeter is the density of zinc. Let's go find carbon. Typically, the de density of carbon, whether it is in the form of graphite or in the form of diamond, is 2.3 grams per cubic centimeter. So how many times more dense than typical carbon is this? About a million times more dense. What do you think the densest element in the periodic table is? Have we talked about this before? Yeah, we have. What, do you remember what it was? It, there's a tie. There's a, a slight tie. I'm trying to remember the elements, but not really. They were like 20. Ah, oh, there you go. Iridium and plat. No. Iridium and oh, osmium. osmium. Okay. All right. Iridium and osmium. Um, <clears throat> iridium is a metal that's found in asteroids and I don't know enough chemistry to remember the deal with osmium, but they're heavy elements, probably very rare in abundance. Even the heaviest elements in the periodic table or the densest elements are still only 23 grams per cubic centimeter. Meaning what Vladimir already intuited before, this ain't your pappy's carbon, right? This ain't no diamond, this ain't no graphite. This ain't nothing like you ever seen before on planet earth. You know what it's like, it's like you took those allotropes of carbon, wherever the hell they, uh, I lost them here. It's like you took this atomic structure and then you took a hammer and you just smashed all the atoms down until they're crushed up against each other. I mean, let's try to really pretend we had art skills for a second. Let's first look at a carbon atom because it's gonna be hard for me to draw. Nope, damn it, that's not what I want. Uh, a carbon atom. Uh, remember that the most, <clears throat> The most common form of carbon here is a nucleus with six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. So I don't know if I like that picture as much. I don't know why. I don't what I like this picture. This picture makes me happy. Does that picture make me happy? What picture makes me the happiest? Uh, maybe this picture, okay? Okay, so in what follows, we're gonna to attempt to draw a little section of a white dwarf, but we're gonna to try to imagine it under electron degeneracy pressure. 
So let's bust out our art skills. Relative to scale, <coughs> the nuclei of the atoms are much smaller than typically the space. What was the units for two times six <coughs> to the 10? Take a guess. Was I, look at, look was at the it, equation. What do you see on it, top and what do you oh, see? Oh, grams over? over centimeters. But you cubed the centimeters, did you not? Oh yeah, over the, yeah, it's over the third. So, so right. the cube applies to the units, correct? Yes. So grams per cube, grams per centimeter cube. Okay, so I'm gonna try to draw my carbon nuclei as a few red bubbles and a few black bubbles. I don't think I'm gonna be able to like do the whole damn thing. Maybe I'll try. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's one carbon nucleus. I don't know if I wanna keep doing that. So let's try to draw a bunch of carbon nuclei. Maybe I'll cheat and I'll make them kind of look like helium, okay? So maybe I'll do two little black bubbles and two little red bubbles for each carbon nucleus. So these are the carbon nuclei, which are wicked tiny, and they're all kind of jammed down and they can't undergo fusion because they're not high temperature enough. So this is me attempting to do my best carbon nuclei. Unlike in a normal atom, where the electrons are ho hovering around them, these electrons are under intense pressure and are smushed dangerously close to the nuclei. Maybe I'll just use little minus signs for the electrons. And the electrons are kind of buzzing around all over the place. Remember that even though it's made of carbon nuclei, it is the electron degeneracy pressure that's keeping the star afloat. So each one of these little minus signs is a high speed electron buzzing around uncomfortably, just like we saw in the cartoon picture. So this is something like what the interior of a white dwarf would look like. Those carbon atoms, however, are packed really, really close together. This is not a good at cartoon because I'm showing them far apart for clarity. Let's imagine that we had this, do you guys remember the problem that we did a week ago where we did Algol paradox, where we talked about how sometimes stars can transfer uh, matter from one star to another? They call these things contact binaries. They sometimes call them high mass transfer binaries. Uh, oh, oh, by the way, I want to just show you guys a couple things. You know how I said what? All right, let me see how I, I want to do this here. Um, let me show you a picture of the nighttime sky. And we actually do have pictures of white dwarfs, believe it or not. We actually have a picture of one because it turns out that the brightest star in the sky, so you guys recognize this constellation, correct? What do we got here? Ryan. Do you remember what this star is? Sirius. Very good. Sirius is very close to us, Tegan. It's only 8.6 light years away. And it turns out that Sirius is a binary star, and one of the stars in the binary happens to be a white dwarf. That means we actually have a picture of it. Of course, you know I'm going to show it to you. Sirius A is an A-type star with about three solar masses worth of matter. But check out Sirius B here. Do you guys see how much dimmer it is by comparison? I believe the mass of Sirius B is about one solar mass, and the mass of Sirius A is about three solar masses, something like that. I might not have those numbers perfect, but. Notice everyone just how much dimmer Sirius B is than Sirius A, despite being only one third its mass, right? This is a star in a totally different stage of its evolution. <clears throat> In the case of Sirius A and B, I believe their separation is far enough where Sirius B does not take any matter. It doesn't spill off. But let's think about how this might work in a high mass uh, transfer binary. I want to show you guys a picture here. OK. Before I get started, let's imagine that we were talking about Sirius A and B. 
in which one star was say three solar masses, okay? And the other star was about one solar mass. Uh, Sirius A and B are not close enough for this to be an issue, but in other star systems it is. Do you guys understand that there is a distance somewhere between this star and this star where if you put a tiny little man or an astronaut, they would feel a gravitational tug of war from both stars that was roughly equal. Where do you think you would have to go in between, let's say Sirius, let's say one star is three solar masses and the other star is one solar mass. How far along a line between the stars would you have to go before the gravity that pulls you to the right from the white dwarf was equal to the gravity from the left from the big star? Just take a guess. Would it be halfway in between? No. No, because this one's three times more massive. It would probably be just use your intuition. Three solar I masses. Mean, I wanted to say uh, one third, but uh, like the relationship is probably not linear. So no, no, it is. It oh, is for real. The, okay. The center of mass formula is linear, so it turns out to Vladimir be just that simple. It turns out to be you'd have to be three times closer to the white dwarf, right? And this is what's called an equipotential surface. It's a point where the gravity is zero. Because if the star on the right tugs you with the same force as the gravity to the left, there's no gravitational force. Oh. Now, wait, it gets more interesting. These stars are in a rapid rotation, right? Let's throw rotation into the mix. You know how when you go to those merry-go-round, uh, those amusement park rides like the Gravitron, where you're spinning and you feel centrifugal forces that fling you against the wall? When you add rotation, it turns out that there's gravitational equilibrium points, not only on a line between the two stars, but all the way around both stars. In physics, it's known as the Roche lobe or something like that. It's basically a figure eight. And if you're on this dotted line, the gravity of any point particle is exactly zero because it's a balance between the two gravities of the stars and the rotation. What happens is as the main sequence companion turns into a red giant, it sometimes expands its radius by a factor of 100, and it spills outside of the Roche lobe. And that's when you get what they've called here a mass transfer stream. Plasma starts to pull off of one star, and it starts to go into rotation around the other star. The issue with gas in these scenarios is the gas is collisional because it's so finely spread out like sand on the beach that the particles of gas start to rub against one another and they become wicked hot. I mean like over 10,000 Kelvin hot, sometimes so hot that they're on the verge of having nuclear fusion reactions take place inside the disk. These are called accretion disks and we have a way of sort of observing them. So let's take a think about what's called a high mass transfer binary. It's gonna come up in today's lecture. Sorry, in Just today's homework. One last question. So what, what are those blue things representing in this uh, illustration? No, the one that you're right behind you right now. Oh, 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 oh. the yeah. blue things were supposed to be electrons. Okay, thank you. Because the white dwarf is held up by electron to generate some pressure. So, so to help there, these are the electrons and these were the carbon nuclei. I was just trying to you know, I can take notes as bullet points, but if we have to draw a cartoon, it helps us to visualize what's going on, okay? Okay, so uh, I'm about to end this lecture. I, I'm just gonna kind of make one last point and then we'll get there. Um, white dwarfs are often found in what are called high mass transfer binaries. Uh, they're sometimes called contact binaries and another name for them that's going to show up in our homeworks today is they call them x-ray binaries and let's draw a picture of what's happened here so we have a a red giant star 
in a binary orbit with a white dwarf, plasma spills from one star and starts to orbit in an extremely high temperature disk. And it's called an accretion disk. Some of the matter from the disk actually spills down onto the white dwarf and it can ignite a burst of nuclear fusions at the surface of the white dwarf known as a nova. The white dwarfs sometimes dramatically flare up. <clears throat> Here's another thing. Accretion disks are very, very hot. They're like black bodies that have just become way hotter than an ordinary star. As a result, accretion disks often emit in the X-ray spectrum. Do stars give off appreciable amounts of X-rays? What do you think? Uh, some. Not all. <laughs> well, let's game this out, Vladimir. What are the ranges of temperatures from an M star to an O star? Uh, okay, 3,000 kelvins to 30,000 kelvins. At 3,000 kelvin, your ween peak is in the infrared. At yeah. 30,000 kelvin, your it's ween peak is in the ultraviolet. Right. And if you look at the X-rays. Yeah, not, in fact, let's look at the actual, the sun is one that we have a very nice plot for. So we'll just do that one. Uh, although it would be nice to find this for an O star because that would be the most extreme form. But remember, Vladimir, let's actually look at one of these. Let's look at a more professional graph, not like this cartoon bullshit they show you in your book. Let's look at a real fucking graph with units and shit so you can see what's being measured, okay? This is a real graph, a graph with labels, all right? Black you, uh, you can see the real flux of the sun by the time you get into the ultraviolet is like a small pitiful fraction of this light that it gives off in the visible domain. And think about it, Vladimir, X-rays don't even start until about 10 nanometers. So there's your X-rays right there. Stars are really, really, really weak X-ray emitters. Okay, next stop in the logical chain. Not only does this happen with white dwarfs, but you will see in today's homework that sometimes instead of a white dwarf, you could have also neutron stars and black holes have the same scenario. Or a neutron star or a black hole. So neutron stars, white dwarfs, and black holes are all found in this scenario. Bear with me here because I'm, I'm going somewhere, okay? If you want to hunt for high mass transfer binaries, you don't do it by looking at visible wavelengths. Why not? Because you will see this star, that star is giving off light, but you're not going to see that star and you're not gonna see that accretion disk because they're way too small and they're way too dim. Instead, what you do is you go and build yourself a big old X-ray telescope. And we have one, it's known as the Chandra X-ray Observatory, named after a scientist I'm about to tell you about. And there's a reason why the scientist I'm gonna tell you about is, uh, is named after this. <clears throat> okay, let's get this guy out here because we're gonna need him. This is an illustration of the Chandra X-ray Telescope. I want you guys to think of it as kind of like the Hubble Space Telescope, but for X-rays. And I want to show you guys a couple of different pictures here. Um, let me show you a picture of the Milky Way galaxy at optical or visible wavelengths. We can actually take a, a full picture of the Milky Way galaxy at visible light. And I want you guys to tell me what you're seeing here. Wait. This is the Milky, Milky Way. Vladimir, I'm sorry? Milky Way? Yeah, a picture of our own galaxy. Suspicious. Look, what's happening is we're taking a picture of the entire sky and we're in the disk, but we're looking 
we're looking at the disk. Of the, let me hear. Let me show you. Oh, okay. So, uh, so because earlier you said we cannot take a picture of our own galaxy. I lied to you. I lied to you because you weren't ready for the truth yet. Uh, Look, sometimes we take pictures of galaxies, Vladimir, and we see them edge on. This is going to be related to one of the projects that you and I are potentially going to work on. We're going to try to measure the rotation of an edge on galaxy. Okay. This is a distant galaxy, and you can see that we're seeing it edge on with the dust lanes, right? Now look at our own picture of the Milky Way. Do you get it? Like, that's the bulge. That's the disk. We're like on, we're out in the disk, and we're looking through a cross section of it, right? So that's why you can do it. That's why you can do it in a way, right? Um, so what's going on here? What's causing these dark spots? Hmm. Let me try this a different way. What is emitting What is emitting light in this picture of our galaxy? Where's the light coming from? From stars. From stars. Why can't I see stars here? Uh, maybe it's the, no, no. You're supposed no. to know the answer to this question, students. There's stuff in the way. Yeah, say that. What? Yeah, there's, there's some stuff in the there's way. There's stuff in the way. I want oh, you. To, just, no. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me what that stuff is, though, Tegan. What's the stuff that blocks starlight? Um, oh, I forgot the name of it. It's, um, is it like dust? That's right, Tegan. It's dust. Yeah. It's cosmic nanodust. What is cosmic nanodust usually made out of? Oh, it's carbon. It's Very like good. Just like a white dwarf, they're made out of carbon. You think there's a relationship there? Who knows? I got to think about that. Okay, anyway, <laughs> now let's try to do something else. Let's now look at a picture of the Milky Way galaxy, but let's not look at the optical. Let's look at the infrared. There, it depends which wavelengths you look at. Here's one picture of the Milky Way at infrared wavelengths. What are you seeing? Oh, that's not a great one. All right, fine. Skip that one. Try that one. Oh, sorry, that's not one. Uh, let's do this. Let's do this one. This is a picture of that same picture of the galaxy, but we're now looking at infrared, infrared wavelengths. What is causing the light? Still the stars. Where'd the dust lanes go? They, they emit infrared as well. Actually, they do. The infrared is actually a huge band, Vladimir. So it kind of depends what wavelength of the infrared. There's near infrared and there's far infrared. I believe oh. if you if you look in the near infrared, you see through the dust oh, lanes. The, the, the infrared is uh, oh, okay. So the dust does not block infrared. It blocks uh, more. Um, I've I've got to say it. something confusing here. And when I say confusing shit, people get lost naturally. In the near infrared, the longer wavelengths penetrate through the dust and you see the starlight. But if you go further into the infrared, remember that the dust grains are little spherical black bodies and eventually they start to glow when they're heated up by starlight. So at certain wavelengths of the infrared, you actually see the glowing dust. Dust glows at infrared wavelengths. Do you see, however, that the dust is still constrained to the disk of the galaxy? Remember, it's the disk where the gas and the stars are. Now I want to show you a third picture, a picture of the Milky Way galaxy seen at X-ray wavelengths. So here is the Milky Way, but instead of infrared, we're going to type X-ray. And at first, this picture is going to be totally freaking confusing to you, and that's why I'm showing it to you. This is an all-sky survey of the Milky Way galaxy at X-ray wavelengths. Nice. OK. See if you can start to piece together what's going on here. So the little, so there are a crap ton of little dots, little separate dots. Those are called point sources. So we're seeing yeah. X-ray point sources. Very good, Vladimir. Let's talk about the little dots. Some of the point sources are very bright. Those things are probably a little closer to us. Some of the point sources are dim. They're probably farther away. But these are all X-ray point sources. Where the shit did the disk go? I don't see the disk no more. Huh, what does so that the, mean? The disk isn't here because the stars emit very little uh, x-rays, so they just kind of go away. Right, but okay. Actually, let's ask the more important question. 
what are causing all of these X-ray point sources? What are we seeing here? We're not looking at stars anymore. Like Vladimir said, we'd see the stars constrained to the disk if it was all stars. We're not looking at stars. So what is glowing at X-ray wavelengths? So if only I could think of something that might be glowing at X-ray wavelengths. Oh, I can't figure it out. I can't even imagine what could be glowing at X-ray wavelengths. Can you guys tell me what's glowing at X-ray wavelengths? So like white dwarfs or neutron stars or black holes? I mean, but altogether. They, they don't give off a lot of light. What is actually- Yeah, but they give, uh, they, but they give off the X-rays. They uh, accretion. Off, the accretion disks give off the X-rays. Every single point source in this picture is an accretion disk from a high mass transfer binary star. You can't see the stars. You can't see the neutron stars, the white dwarfs, or the black holes. But in a way, you're seeing all the leftover degenerate corpses of stars. They're left behind, right? So what's and this big bulge? Oh, because there is a huge black hole and there is a huge accretion disk. Well, well, or, or what's happening is several point sources are merged together. So there might be two or three objects along the same line of sight. The, ex, the exposure, the photograph is overexposed there, Vladimir. Okay. But yes, we actually have seen accretion disks around black holes. So I'll show you that picture next time. But I got one last point to make, and then I'm really stopping. I know I'm probably busted right now. Uh, we see these accretion. Notice that the accretion disks are not bound to the disk and you know what that tells me guys remember that galaxy that i showed you earlier we're seeing them distributed all throughout the halo and that means there's all these stars that have died all over the halo they're not just constrained to the disk anymore do you see what i mean we were basically seeing those accretion disks scattered haphazardly sometimes in the disk and sometimes in the halo there's must have been generations of stars that died up here is what that tells me. There is a legendary astrophysicist that this telescope is named after, and I have to mention him before class ends because it's related to our homework. His name was, and oh my God, you're going to have to forgive me here, Subramanian Chandrasekhar. I'm pretty confident about the Chandrasekhar part. I'm not too confident about the pronunciation of Subramanian. Okay, but anyways, legendary astrophysicist who something something like at age 21 took a uh, a train ride or a boat ride from India to England to meet his mentor the great astronomer Sir, Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington and he basically used Albert Einstein's brand new equations for general relativity to model what would happen to a white dwarf if the accretion disks kept dropping little plops of plasma onto them and he had a very profound insight, and I'm going to kind of show it to you in a lame cartoon form because I'm sort of out of time here. His idea is that if you keep adding mass to a white dwarf, you'll add pressure, gravitational pressure, but because the thermal pressure doesn't support the star, but instead quantum mechanics does, you keep compressing the electrons into smaller and smaller and smaller spaces, and you'll speed the electrons up and eventually the speeds of the electrons will get so intense that they will approach the speed of light. And you guys know that in relativity, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So then he tried to figure out what would happen to the star when it, the electrons were compressed so much that they hit the speed of light. And he hypothesized that the star would catastrophically explode into another type of supernova known as a type 1a supernova. And What's so cool is, uh, I don't know if I have a picture of these here. Type 1a supernovas are actually more violent than the high mass star supernovas we talked about before. If, and it's, it doesn't make any sense, right? A high mass star is often 30 solar masses, 50 solar masses. And you'd think that with more matter, when it would explode, it would be more violent. A white dwarf star is only like one solar mass, yet when they explode, 
their luminosities typically reach 10 billion times that of the sun. In fact, white dwarf supernovas are so intense. Here's a famous picture of one in a galaxy called NGC 4526. This went off in 1994. We knew it was not a high mass star supernova because there were no hydrogen lines in the spectrum. It was all just carbon and oxygen and a bit of helium. Notice that the intensity of the white dwarf supernova rivals the entire nucleus of the galaxy, which probably contains probably tens of billions of stars, right? So much that even though we're looking at this thing from probably 100 million light years away, we can see the white dwarf supernova as well as we can the nucleus of the galaxy. That's just one solar mass star that made that explosion. Here's the other creepy thing about these white dwarf supernovas. Because they're based on the laws of relativity and they're compressing electrons, the weird thing is I want to show you this one wacky equation. When this is now known as the Chandra Sekar, Chandra Sekar mass limit. The kookiest thing that came out of his calculation was that he was able to demonstrate that the mass limit of a white dwarf did not depend on the initial mass of the white dwarf, but the conditions were only dependent upon constants of nature itself. And this was the calculation that he worked out. The calculation includes big G, the gravitational constant. It includes Planck's constant, which you've seen before. That's a symbol of quantum mechanics. It includes the speed of light and it includes the mass of a hydrogen atom. All the rest of this is wacky numbers that are over your pay grade. It does not include anything else. And he was able to calculate that all white dwarfs will explode at the exact same limit. And that limit is 1.44 solar masses. In our class, we'll just round it to 1.4 solar masses. So this is called just write this down. This is our last note, and then we can take a tea break. The upper limit to a white dwarf is 1.4 solar masses. They always explode at this limit. Um, it's known as the Chandra Sekhar mass limit. And when stars reach this Chandra Sekhar mass limit, they undergo a dramatic type 1a supernova. It's interesting how type 2 supernova comes before type 1. Um, it's about the logical development of when they happen. I had to get to star death before. You know what happened, Vladimir? People were observing supernova and they didn't know what the crap they were looking at at first. So depending on whether, what type of absorption or emission lines they had, they would classify them as this is a type one, this is a type two, this is a type three. And after they were observing them for years, they started to understand the picture. The reason why type two came before type one is you're getting the story forwards. Scientists always have to try to discover the story backwards. Do you see what I mean? They get a mess of observations and then they have to tell a tale about it. You guys just get the tale. Okay, you get the story, right? So, so there's type 1A, there, there has to be type 1B? Yes, we can go there if you want to. It has to do with supernovae that, that are, I think it's, you know, it's about whether their spectrums contain helium or not. For now, let's, I'm not gonna be able to get into the type 1B and 1C. There's also a type 1C, by the way. I think it would be good for you guys just, you know what, fuck the A. I shouldn't have even done that. Type one supernova, okay, Doop, done. Okay. <laughs> Never was an A there, pay no attention to the man. Never seen the A, never seen I the would, A. I would be happy if you guys could remember that there's two basic types of supernova. One that come from white dwarfs, one that come from high mass stars. And let me say this last thing. If they always explode at the same mass, they always explode with the same luminosity. And the luminosity of a white dwarf supernova is always 10 to the 10 solar luminosities. Because of that, 
white dwarf supernovae have become what's called in astronomy a standard candle. A standard candle is an object that has a known luminosity and you can use this to determine the distances to distant galaxies. For instance, one of my undergraduate advisors at the University of Arizona, he was an expert on type 1A white dwarf supernova. I can't see the bottom. Sorry, bud. I just wrote in crappy font, standard candle. I wanted All to- All right, I got that. that term. Okay, so one of the reasons why, and this is, I really have, oh, it's, oh my God, it's 153. All right, I gotta stop. I am so sorry. I didn't realize what I was doing today. All right. Uh, so in some ways, once I get juiced up, I could go on forever. I need to know when to pause. I wanted to be able to wrap up white dwarfs so that next time we could do neutron stars and black holes. And I've done that. Um, let's give you guys a break. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, refresh, and then we'll whack out today's homework, which is going to be really quick. Okay. See you in a bit. Sorry about that delay. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna try to be really efficient today because I'm, I'm leaving for New York after this and I've got a lot to do. So I'm gonna kind of try to push hard this time. I mean, I was considering giving you guys the pre-recorded version, but I'm willing to do the problems if enough of you want to. Um, name, AS1020, homework number 11, chapter 18. Uh, does someone have the problems for me? I do. All right, hit me. Um, 52, 53, 55, 56, 61. All right. Uh, Andy, read us uh, chapter 18, number 52. Let's get right into it. All right. Oh shoot, this is backwards. Um, black hole one, you've just discovered you are a new X-ray binary, which we will call HYPX1, HYPs for Hypothetical, the system HYPX1 contains a bright uh, B2 main sequence star orbiting an unseen con compare on the separations to the stars is separations the separation gender to be 20 million kilometers and the orbital period of the visible star is four days all right let's draw the picture we got a star We know it to be a spectral type B2 star. It's in orbit around some mysterious companion that we're trying to determine. And the whole reason we can see it is because it's an X-ray binary. And that means it's got an accretion disk around it. Now, <clears throat> there's a test, okay? The test goes like this. If the mass of the unseen companion is less than 1.4 solar masses, 
that's the so-called Chandrasekhar mass limit, we know that the unseen companion is a white dwarf. I didn't get to neutron stars today, but the neutron stars have a range of masses from 1.4 solar masses to three solar masses, and they have their own upper limit, somewhat similar to a Chandrasekhar mass limit. Finally, if the unseen companion is larger than three solar masses, then most likely it's a black hole. We cannot see the unseen companion because we can only see the accretion disk at X-rays, and at visible light, we only see the B2 star. This is too small and too dim to be seen. We're going to have to determine the mass of the system and then the mass of the unseen companion. Luckily, Andy, it should tell us what the mass of a B2 star is. Maybe that's in part B or something, right? Wasn't there sort of a part A and a part B here? Um, well, hell, I can't remember. It's been a while. Come on, Blackboard. Stop being stupid. Yeah, there's a part e, part B and part A. Okay, so what's part A ask, Andy? Use Newton's versions of Kepler's third law to calculate the sum oh, of the masses to Sorry the two stars in the system. Hint, C, mathematical bright, uh, mathematical insight. All right, don't worry about that. I'm your mathematical insight. I'm the guru, okay? So, um, unfortunately, I kind of need to use my uh, my board again. So I'm going to erase some stuff. Do you guys have uh, No, I started a little bit late. I had to help my dad with something. Sorry. Uh, I'll copy this. Write a quick and tiki masala while you write it down, okay? That works for me, bud. <laughs> Forty million kilometers. Mm. Love working from home. <laughs> Delicious. All right, have you got this? Uh, one point four to three and um, three. Okay. Yes. All right, Andy, are you good? Yeah, I got it. By the way, you meant to write a uh, black hole mass is over three solar masses, right? Not just solar mass. Uh, I meant to write three solar mass units. Did I not do that? No, it was just M and then sign of sun. Oh, three solar masses. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Thanks, bud. OK. We're going to use NK3. Do you guys remember the Kitty edition of Newton's Kepler's third law? A to the cu uh, A cubed over uh, P squared. Do you remember the units, Vladimir? Uh, astronomical units for A and the years for P. Correct. Now, look, I got a train to catch here, so. I ain't got a lot of time for you guys to slowly poke your way through dimensional analysis. Let's make this light speed. The separation distance is 20 million. Was it kilometers or meters? That's what I can't remember. Uh, I have it as kilometers. All right. So we can convert quickly convert that to astronomical units. An AU is 150 million, which means that A is 2 fifteenths of an AU, right? Whatever 2 fifteenths is. <clears throat> I canceled out the 10 to the 6, and then I canceled out one of the zeros. That's how I got the 2 fifteenths, if you're wondering about my mathematical skills. Um, that's 0 0.133. The period is four days. I'm going to qu quickly convert days to years. I'm going to divide by 365. Four parts in 365 is 0.01 years. And that's actually good to, well, let's do two sig figs. 0.11 years. 
0.011 years. Okay, now let's apply NK3 for part A, label it part A. The total mass of the system is then 0.13 AU cubed over 0 0.0111 years squared. Now that's your job, punch it and crunch it. Meanwhile, I'll draw in some x-rays coming from the accretion disk. And I'll draw some visible light coming from the B2 star. The unseen companion doesn't give off crap. Uh, I spelled visible, visible. But I assure you, I'm quite normal, visible. What do we got? Hit me. Mateus, what do you have? Can you read me? Because you're a little small on my screen. 18.2. Let's just go with 18. What are the units? Uh, AU per year. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. The kitty addition is a magic formula. If A goes in AUs, if P goes in years, then the total mass of the system must be measured in, let's see, it's a mass, right? Let's think of a unit of mass that would make sense for two stars to have a value of 18. Solar units? Oh. What, give me some, what are some units of mass, Mateus? Kilograms? Okay, do you think the mass of two stars is 18 kilograms? Never. No. So it can't be kilograms. And it can't be grams. Tons or even heavier. Uh, solar? No. Oh my God. Solar there you masses. go. There you okay. go. You got it. You got it. In the Keplerian version, the mass of the sun is one. That's how you get A squared equals P cubed. All right. 18 solar mass units. Andy, what's part B say? And determine the mass of the unseen comparison. Companion. Is a, companion. Companion. A neutron star or a black hole. Explain. Hint. A B2 main sequence star has a mass of about 10 M sun. Um, Solar mass units. So if the, if the scene companion is 10 solar masses, then we have 10 solar masses plus the unknown companion equals 18 solar masses. And our unknown companion has a mass of, take it away students. Oh, I don't know, like 30. <laughs> okay. So like eight solar mass units then. And therefore our unseen companion is a black hole. It's a black hole. All right. We'll talk about black holes on Tuesday's class. The second problem is going to be just like this one. We're going to do it faster, even faster, OK? No effing around. Andy, are you all set? I'm all set. My holes seem to be less mysterious. Oh, don't worry. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll mystify you plenty good when it's time. All right. Yeah, just Black holes are more common we talked about in the vernacular of science fiction and stuff, but let me tell you, there's a reason why, because they're so damn weird. Okay. 
I'm not drawing a pretty picture this time. Um, Tegan, read me. Can you read me one? Can you read me 53? Um, I have it up, but it's it's upside down. <laughs> I know. I screwed up. <laughs> what am I going to do here? Uh, Hang on. Maybe I can rotate it. Eight. Yeah. That's okay, my... I got it. Oh, you, you figured it out? All right, thank you. Yeah. It's All what, 53? Right. Yep. All right, a black hole, part two. You've discovered a new X-ray binary, which we'll call Hype X2. The system Hype X2 contains a bright G2 main sequence star orbiting an unseen companion. The separation of the stars is estimated to be 12 million kilometers, and the orbital period of the visible star is five days. Um, hey, what's the, uh, what's the mass of a G2 main sequence star? You're supposed to know. Our sun? Yeah, it's just like our sun. One solar mass unit. Okay, let's do this wicked fast. Kilometers to AU. What's 12 parts out of uh, 150? Zero point zero eight AU. Five days is five three hundred and sixty feet. Oh, what? Whoa, geez, Louise, <laughs> moving too fast. So five parts out of three sixty five is zero point zero one four years. I don't know if you want to call it. Do they do A and B here? Yeah, they. We know the drill. Do a a is the total mass. B is the unseen companion. So the total mass of the system, a cubed over p squared, is zero point zero eight au cubed over zero point zero one four years squared. I'm sorry, I'm going so quickly today. But I got my mind and my money and my money and my mind. You know what I'm saying? Right. <clears throat> Why don't you guys punch that up for me? 2.6 uh, solar masses. Okay. So for part B, the mass of our unseen companion is 2.6. Solar masses minus one solar masses equals 1.6 solar masses. What is our object class? Um, a neutron star. Right. Um, I would have several problems like this on the final if you're planning on taking it, just in case there's kooks out there that want to take my final exam. <laughs> All right. 53 down the hatch. Um, Mateus, you're going to do 55 when you're ready. I'm going to erase now. What, oh, what's even. the bottom saying? Neutron star? Neutron star. All right. Mateus 55. All right. So neutron star density. A typical neutron star has a mass of about 1.5 solar masses and a radius of 10 kilometers. Letter A. Calculate the average density of a neutron star in kilograms per cubic centimeter. Okay, first order of business. Remember that the density of a sphere is three times the mass over four pi r cubed. That's from today's lecture. Rewind the tape if you can't remember how we got that. Um, <clears throat> we do want the units to come out in grams per centimeter cubed. So we're gonna have to play the same games that we did earlier. 1.5 solar masses, we're going to go from solar masses to kilograms 
we're going to go from kilograms to grams. One solar mass is two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. One kilogram is a thousand grams. 1.5 times two is three, correct? Did I do that right, Vladimir? Oh, what is it? Oh, yeah. Right? So that gives us three times 10 to the power of 33 grams. With a radius of 10 kilometers, I'm going to pull some bullshit on you guys here. I happen to know the conversion factor from centimeters to kilometers. I use it in my solar system class a lot. So that's 1 million centimeters. All right. Now it's time to calculate the density of a sphere now that we've got our units in grams and centimeters. The density of the neutron star is then 3 times 3 times 10 to the 33 oops grams over 4 times pi times 1 million centimeters cubed. Um, 3 and pi cancel out, so you get 3 fourths times 10 to the 6 times 3 is 18, and 33 minus 18 is 15. So I'm guessing it's 7.5 times 10 to the 14. How'd I do? You guys see how I did that? You see my Scooby-Doo magic here? I uh, kind of assumed that what 4 pi is about 12-ish? Oh, 12 no, Vladimir, I did another old astronomer trick. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> you like that move? <laughs> did anyone punch it in? How close did I get? Punch it in with the pie and see how the difference is. I bet it's barely a difference at all. So it's 9.33. I think I'll wait for you. Three times three exp 33 divide by four, divide by pi, divide by one exp six, shift cube. Okay, so it was 7.2. Big deal, right? I did three fourths is 75, but. 7.2. What are the units? Um, grass per centimeter cubed. cubed. OK. So this is like good old uh, pi equals 3 and e equals pi. Wait, I'm sorry, Mateus. Did they ask for grams per cubic centimeter, or did they ask for kilograms per cubic centimeter? Grams per cubic centimeter, I'm pretty sure. All right. Yeah. Oh, no, it's kilograms per cubic yeah. centimeter. Yeah. Right. Just, it just occurred to me. Okay, so what would the difference be then? A factor of what? Three. So, so 7.2 times 10 to the 11. Yeah. Sorry, that's, that's what they actually wanted. Uh, box that one instead, sorry. Okay, so then was that part A, Mateus? Didn't they want us to compare it to Mount Everest or something? Yes, that was part A. So part B says, compare the mass of one cubic centimeter of neutron star material to the mass of Mount Everest. Um, and he says uh, it's almost five times 10 to the 10 kilograms. Can I erase this upper bit here, please? Yeah. All right. So. If we're going to compare our neutron star to Mount Everest, here's Mount Everest, OK? And a cubic centimeter is like a sugar cube or a teaspoon. So <clears throat> the mass of the neutron star was one, would obviously be 7.2 times 10 to the 11 kilograms, because that's how many kilograms are in a cubic centimeter, right? The mass of Mount Everest is five times 10 to the 10 kilograms. Is that what you had, Mateus? Yes, that's right. So the mass of one teaspoon worth of neutron star juice, if you want to call it juice, is seven 
times 10 to the 11 kilograms over five times 10 to the 10 kilograms, seven fifths, if I remember my fractions. So it's maybe 1.4, oh, times 10 to the one. So it's 14 times more massive. A teaspoon of neutron star goo would have a mass 14 times greater than all of Mount Everest. That's some messed up shit right there, right? It's literally a big old ball of neutrons in your neutron star. We have to talk about that next time. Those are neutrons, by the way. Oh, that's part B. Where's my manners? Okay, I want to erase. Vladimir? All set. All right. Just a second. Yep. Okay. All right. Vladimir, you're reading number 56, please. Um. Radii. I'm not. I'm not sure if I read it correctly, but um. Sorry. Can you say that one more time? Uh, Schwartz, uh Schwartz, It's called the Swarshield radius. The Swar Shield radius. Swarshield radius. The Swarshield radius. Um, calculate the Swarshield radius. In kilometers of each of the following a um hold on vlad can i pause you for a second yeah yeah i told myself i would not do any exposition on these problems today i would just kind of pump and dump the operation here but i do need to make one exposition about black holes which i have not gotten to in my lecture the black hole itself is a microscopic dot of mass. And we sometimes refer to the black hole as a singularity. That's because all of the mass is packed into that dot. But the truth of it is there's a, there's a zone around the singularity where gravity has warped the curvature of space so intensely that no light can escape. So there's kind of an invisible barrier surrounding the singularity. And that invisible barrier is a sphere. And the sphere has a radius. The radius is known as the Schwarzschild radius. It's not to say that this is the radius of the black hole, because the black hole has, is a point particle. Is it a zero dimensional point? Yeah, people wonder about this. See, it's hard for us to test any hypotheses because we can't get any light out of the zone, the event horizon surrounding it. But we hypothesize that it's possible that gravity might just keep crushing it down forever to a singularity. Now, in reality, Vladimir, I suspect that there is some finite radius because first you will compress the quarks together and there'll be like a quark degeneracy pressure. And then there might even be smaller things under that that we've yet to discover. So. I don't exactly know what happens. I don't think quantum mechanics will really let you get to zero dimensions. But as far as we know, it's going to be so small that we might as well assume it's zero. If, keep in mind that if you were to look at the black hole from a, a distance away, it would kind of look like you were looking at a dark sphere or even a dark hole in space. Um, we do have one picture now. We never used to, but we weirdly have one now. But instead, I'm just going to show you a weed smoking artist illustration because that's probably more effective. Um, this is a weed smoking artist illustration of of what it might be look like. What what it might look like. Yeah, but it's not even close to real. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. It is true that space would get a little warpy near the event horizon. But, but this is basically the idea. There's the singularity, and that's the Schwarzschild radius. Now, there's two different formulas, depending on what units you want to use. In MKS, the Schwarzschild radius is 2 times big G times the mass of your black hole 
divided by the speed of light squared. But since 2G and the speed of light are, are all constants, there's kind of a kitty addition of the Schwarzschild radius, which is just three kilometers times the mass measured in solar mass units, okay? <clears throat> and that's the one we'll probably use for part A. So read part A. Um, a, uh, a 10 uh, to the eighth uh, solar mass is black hole in the center of a quasar. Okay, get ready for this, guys, because black hole mathematics is pretty complex, okay? Our Schwarzschild radius is then basically 3 times 10 to the 8, okay? Solar mass units, or, well, they kind of cancel out, and you get 3 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. Black hole mathematics is pretty tough. You got to multiply things by 3, you know? Okay, so uh, now we'll go on to part B. Oh, if you're worried about units over here, sometimes people write it as the mass per solar mass, all right? That way your units kind of ba balance out. This is the variable, that's the unit, okay? Watch out for that. Uh, what's part B? Um, just a second. Uh, B, uh... A five solar masses black hole that formed in the supernova of a massive star. Sorry, Vladimir, I was running some laundry and it was just loud. What, what was it? Um, a five solar masses black hole uh, that was formed in the supernova of a massive star. So five times three is 15, right? Yeah. Part C. Um, a mini black hole with the mass of the moon. Okay. The mass of the moon is seven times 10 to the 22 kilograms. Here we're going to use the actual formula because we're in MKS units anyways. Okay. So the Schwarzschild radius is two times big G, seven times 10 to the negative 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared times the mass of the moon, seven times 10 to the 22 kilograms, all divided by the speed of light squared. The speed of light, remember, is three times 10 to the eight meters per second squared. I should have started this up above. So can you guys tell me what you get when you punch all that in? Um, one times 10 to the negative four meters. Does that sound plausible? Sure. Um, what would that be in millimeters, Vladimir? Uh, so 110 uh, on, one tenth of a mil millimeter. Come no, on. actually one, one millimeter. False again. Ah. I thought, I thought you, you guys were embraced with the metric system. 10 to the minus right. millimeters. Uh, okay, let's do, let's do the dimensional analysis. 100, negative two. A millimeter is 10 to the minus three meters. So you're a tenth smaller than that. Yeah, so tenth of a millimeter. That's right. Uh, yeah, Vladimir, a tenth of a millimeter is probably about the size of a pinhead or so. Actually, a pinhead is probably a millimeter. Uh, a tenth of a millimeter is about the thickness of a piece of paper, more or less. If you could compress the moon into something a little bit smaller than a BB, 
you would crush the mass below its own Schwarzschild radius and it would form a little mini black hole. Now by mini, it would have the mass of the moon. So you could orbit around that, <laughs> but it would only have an event horizon that was a 10th of a millimeter in radius. That'd be some effed up shit. We call these things mini black holes. They're hypothetical, but they're within the laws of physics that they could exist. And usually the way it works is if it can be created sooner or later, the universe does create it. So who knows? All right, there's one more part, part D. It's kind of funny. Wait, no, C. I still need to see. I'm All right, tell me when you're done, Vlad. I am just cruising so fast today, <laughs> but I'm sure no one objects to that either, right? All right. I normally don't like to go at this pace. I find it a little disturbing, but today we're doing it. Are you, Vladimir, are you done? Yeah, yeah, I'm done. All right, I'm racing. There's a part D. Um, a mini black hole formed when a super advanced civilization decided decides to punish you unfairly by squeezing you until you become so small that you disappear inside your own event horizon. Okay, well, damn. I suppose then if you can make a mini black hole out of the moon, you can make a mini black hole out of just about anything, right? So let's <laughs> punish you out. unfairly. Uh, I weigh, I weigh a little over 200 pounds, which I'm not happy about, but let's say you, let's say you chopped me, uh, to go to, it's what, uh, 2.2 kilograms per pound. So just roughly take your weight and divide it by two. So maybe 80 to hundred kilograms would be the typical mass. It's like of 91. 91. Okay. So let's go with a mass of 90 kilograms for a typical human. I'm assuming that I'm a typical human and we all know that ain't true. Okay, so anyways, uh, <laughs> um, then uh, we could create a super mini black hole by squeezing ourselves down beyond our Schwarzschild radius. Two times seven times 10 to the negative 11. The units are meters cubed per kilogram per second squared. That would be an in interesting execution. What? like this, like squeezing a person until they become a black hole. It's just right. an interesting so execution. The idea is at first you think black holes exist and then you calculate their event horizon. But after a while, you start thinking about it in a slightly different way. You start thinking of the event horizon as if you take any object and you squish it down, because this only depends upon mass, you start realizing that anything could become a black hole if you compress the mass such that its gravity starts to warp space time. Um, and, and that leads to some other interesting thoughts. We will explore them more casually and funly uh, next lecture. Okay, so can someone punch that up and tell me what you get? Three times ten to the second MS. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Uh, I can't tell you. <laughs> Because someone, was trying, to, right someone right. was trying to distract me. That's why. <laughs> so I got about, wow, holy shit. Okay, what'd you um, get? 1.4 times 10 to the negative 25 meters. Okay, so let's say it's, all right, 1.4 times 10 to the negative 25 meters. Um, what do we think? We should try to find, can someone else confirm that, that they got that as well, just so we don't have any errors here? Vladimir, let's look up names of small numbers together and let's see what, what that would be. So there's a cool Wikipedia page. You know, there's more than just millimeters and micrometers and nanometers. This shit goes down forever and there's names of small numbers. I think you guys have have seen me do this stuff before. Um, 
Let's see if we can find something. Oh, wow. Apparently, 10 to the minus 24 is a yachtometer. Yachtometers. Okay, so this would be how many yachtometers is that? So that's 14 yachtometers. False. Do your math right. It's 10 to the minus. Uh, one yacht. Let's write this conversion down. One yachtometer is 10 to the negative 24 meters. So if I have 1.4 times 10 to the minus 25. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, 0 0.14 yachtometers. 14 hundredths of a yachtometer. That's right. Or 0 0.14 YMs. So you would have to crush yourself down to a tenth of a yachtometer, whatever the F that is, in order to, uh, by the way, that's smaller than the diameter of a proton, okay? I think a proton has a femtometer sized radius. Is that right? Femto? Uh, femto is 10 to the minus 15. Let's look this up. Radius of a proton. Oh, wow. I was right. The radius of, man, I actually know some stuff. Sometimes I forget that. Um, the radius of a proton is approximately to one significant figure, one femtometer. This is several orders of magnitude below the radius of a proton. In fact, at 10 to the minus 25, 25 minus 15, 10 orders of magnitude, you would have to compress yourself to 10 billion times smaller than the radius of a proton in wow. order to turn your fat ass into a black hole, okay? <laughs> so you're not probably in danger of such a thing, except, or are you? The next problem will explore what would happen if a neutron star collided with Earth. Um, Vladimir, since your thing is up here, can I, uh, Andy, friends, can I erase this? Yeah, you can erase. All right, let's, I'll have Vladimir read us the last problem just for efficiency's sake. So this is 61. Um, a challenge problem. It's not really a challenge. Okay. <laughs> A neutron star comes to town. Okay. Is this some? Um, a neutron uh, star comes to town. Yeah. Um, suppose a neutron star suddenly appeared uh, in your hometown. Uh, how thick a layer would Earth form as it warped around the neutron star's surface? Assume that the layer formed by Earth has the same average density as the neutron star. Uh, hint, consider the mass of Earth to be distributed in a spherical shell over uh, the surface of the neutron star, and then calculate the thickness of, of such a shell with the same mass as Earth. Uh, the volume of a spherical shell is approximately its uh, surface area times its thickness. So V shell equals uh, 4 pi r squared times uh, the thickness. Okay. Here's because the shell will be thin, you can assume that its radius is the radius of the neutron star. All right. Try to think about what's happening here. You've got dear old planet Earth six times 10 to the 24 kilograms, 6,400 kilometers in radius. And a neutron star is actually way smaller than the Earth. A neutron star typically has a radius of 10 kilometers, making it roughly the size of Boston, okay? But it packs one and a half solar masses of matter into it. Weirdly, if a neutron star collided with Earth, Earth would actually get compressed and slurped onto the surface of the neutron star. And it would become a crystallized neutron crust 
embedded on top of our neutron star. Let's zoom in on the neutron star and let's imagine it works something like this. The neutron star has a radius and the earth is going to be compressed into a thin shell which adds probably a microscopic little bit of matter and a microscopic, well, I guess that's not a microscopic bit of matter, but it's gonna be compressed to a microscopically thin radius. Therefore, we can kind of cheat and we could say that the volume of the shell that was once Earth is the surface area of the star, four pi r squared. So we're taking the surface area and we're just multiplying it by the thickness which I'm going to call delta tau, delta t, all right? Delta t is the thickness of our thin shell. And this is what we're trying to calculate. So put a box around that. That's our man. We know the radius of the neutron star. It's 10 kilometers. How could we figure out the volume that this shell holds? we know that the density of this little thin shell will have to be the same as the density of the neutron star. And we calculated that in a previous problem, didn't we, Mateus? What did we get for the density of a neutron star in problem 55? 7.2 times 10 to the 11th kilograms per centimeter cubed. The trick here is to realize that once Earth gets compressed, its shell has to have the same density as the neutron star. And I know that density is mass divided by volume. I know the mass of Earth, so I can solve for the volume of the shell, and that will tell me how thick it should be. Very clever. The volume of the shell will be the mass divided by the density, six times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Hey, Andrea, yeah. would you mind flipping over that laundry into the dryer? Okay. Oh, you're the best. And you started it? No, no, no. Uh, just twist it, uh, twist the little dial on the right back to like optimal drive. And, and I think it just starts. And that one, there's a lever to start it on the left. Sorry, guys, I'm sort of multitasking today. Um, <clears throat> 7.2 times 10 to the 11 kilograms per cubic centimeter. Sorry about the squish. Can you guys punch that up for me? Um, 8.3 uh, times 10 to the 12th uh, centimeters cubed. Good. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I got tw 12. Oh, yes. sorry. Sorry, I don't know what's going on there with me. I'm now going to take this in Jimmy Jimmy Janet into the equation for the volume of a shell here. But maybe I could erase and do some algebra. So let's. Let's rearrange this. Delta T, the thickness of the shell, will be the volume of the shell divided by 4 pi r squared, the radius of the neutron star. So the thickness will be 8 point. Oh, by the way, remember how we grabbed this number from problem 55? Please make a note that this is from number 55. I actually know where it came from, but I'm trying to train you guys that if you're making a paper in some class and you pull a number out of your butt somewhere, you got to reference your butt. You got to show them where, where it came from, OK? <laughs> That's considered good ethics. Um, so we have eight times 8.3 times 10 to the 12 centimeters cubed 
over four times pi. The radius of a neutron star is 10 kilometers. Does anyone know what that would be in, in centimeters? So one million centimeters. Good, because it's 10 to the five centimeters per kilometer. So divide it by a million centimeters cubed. Sorry about that. I'm being a little Wait, very cubed. Cubed? Uh, so no, it's we're multiplying the surface area by the thickness, right? Yeah. Very yeah. good, Vladimir. Wow, I almost made a huge blunder there. And and we want our thickness to have units of centimeters, so that makes sense unit wise too. Um, I got zero point um, seven. Let's go with seven. One stick thick. Units? Um, centimeters. So what does that mean, Vladimir? Pathetic. How is Earth will be squeezed into a shell of thickness less than one centimeter? Right. The entirety of Earth with you and all your friends would become a crust of neutrons on the surface of a 10 kilometer star, one centimeter in thickness. Now, I have a bedtime story to tell you before we end class. Do you know that there is a genre, a subgenre of science fiction called, wait for it, hard science fiction? The concept behind hard science fiction is that you should pay as little attention to the literary merit and to the artistry as possible. And the entire story should just be a slave to making the science as accurate as possible. And only after the science is good, do you allow yourself any indulgence uh, do you allow yourself the indulgence of writing a story? Now, I want to tell you a story about a hard science fiction book that I love by Robert Forward called Dragon's Egg. This story is so bizarre and so funny that it's even just reading the plot synopsis of it is hilarious. It's about a race of sentient organisms that live on the surface of a neutron star where the gravity is millions of times greater than Earth so they're compressed into these hyper small little things called chilas. They're basically, basically a, a sesame seed. They're like little sesame seeds that are compressed on the surface of a neutron star. And they're only like 0.1 nano micrometer or something in, in, in radius, but they're suppressed little sesame seeds called the chila. And human astronauts from Earth visit a neutron star and discover that these chila are living on the surface of the neutron star in barbarian hordes. And they're, they're subsisting by harvesting neutron, neutron salt scrapes off the surface of the star. And at the time the humans discover them, they're roughly at the stage of civilization comparable to Genghis Khan or something, where they're riding around on little neutron ponies and hitting each other in the head with sticks. And the, the Earthmen and the spacecraft send the Chila a hello message on a radio broadcast signal. But unfortunately, the neutron star is so highly compressed that there is a significant amount of gravitational time dilation on the star. And in the whole story, it, it takes only about an hour of human time for them to relay the message and boink it back to their spacecraft. But gravitational time dilation has so accelerated time that these chila, by the time they get the message, have evolved into such a hyper-intelligent species that it would now be unethical for them to talk to their dummy human counterparts because, because they've gone too far in their technology and humans couldn't really handle it. So they eventually radio back, oh yeah, it was great to get to know you, but you guys are kind of beneath us now and we really wouldn't be fair for us. And that's the whole story, boom, right there. Dragon Six, <laughs> so fucking insane. So um, the details are really good. And if you don't have time to buy it uh, or read it, then I would like to suggest uh, to just expand on my little plot synopsis. Please read the Wikipedia page for Dragon Egg and, and spoil, there we go. Oh, Dragon's Egg, sorry. Go ahead and spoil the story for yourself and just read the plot synopsis 
because it's really, really funny. Okay, here's a, a cover edition from the whatever 70s or something it was made. And yeah, I'm just gonna, you know what? I'm gonna indulge myself and I'm gonna read it with you. Half a million. No, years no, no. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, all right, okay, fine. <laughs> I'll leave it. I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader, as they often say in physics books. Okay, I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader. But I promise you that that plot summary will entertain the pants off you. So here you go. Paste it into the link. Okay, guys, um, we succeeded in compressing ourselves into one hour uh, worth of neutron star fun, and that means I'm going to get to New York before bedtime. So I will see you guys uh, on Tuesday for our final week of lecture. Brian, I, I hope you can see everything. Did you get everything you needed, Brian? If you're there, you can chat me. Yes, okay. So does everyone have this? Can I end the, uh, the class for today? Okay, great hangs as always. Thanks for coming out in force for this penultimate to the penultimate lecture. I'll see you guys next Tuesday. Wait, very, very quick question, just two second question. I didn't realize that IRAF is like a technology. It's not it's not just a website, right? Because at first I, I thought it's the website, but it's like it's a tool. It's a software package, just like um uh, uh just like Windows, any, whatever game. It's it's a set of software suites used for for reducing astronomical data. So basically you put the image files in, and then this lets you analyze the image files and get numbers and quantities out that you want. And to use it, I have to install, um, what is this? Uh, you have some to OS instead of Windows? Yeah, so it, it, usually the best way to run IRAF is on a Linux. Mac or on a Linux system. But here's what we're gonna do, Vladimir. Actually, I'm gonna stop this recording just so that I don't bore the, the video people later.